Hello folks, this is Sula once again. Welcome to another video for League of Legends. This time I'm going to be going through and talking a little bit about the Season 4 World Championships, the ones that are been ongoing for about the past month and which is about to finish this weekend, upcoming in a few days. I haven't been able to post a whole bunch of videos recently. I'm hoping to fix that upcoming. I've, I've gotten away from that a little bit in large part because I've been putting my time towards live streaming and updating my website, but there's really no reason why I can't also use some of the live streaming content for YouTube as well. So as I said, I will try to fix that for the channel in upcoming weeks. In any case though, let's go ahead and dive into the Season 4 World Championships for League of Legends. I have been able to watch I think every single game, not necessarily live all the time, I've been watching a lot of them in, delayed on the video on demand feature, in part because a lot of them are at very awkward times for people living here in North America, but overall it has been a fabulous tournament and I think it's been by far the best of the world championships uh, that have been staged so far. Definitely much better than season 1, 2, and 3. Uh, in comparison to the others. So let me let me talk first of all about what Riot did correctly this time. First and foremost is the format. The format is much, much, much better than uh, particularly the last two World Championships, but uh, also in comparison to the first one that was held. The big change, of course, is that Riot moved to what's basically the system that's used for the World Cup, something that I had actually written about last year and suggested using exactly this format, so I'm glad that they did. Format being 16 teams uh, drawn into four different regions. I, apparently I can't highlight text here on, um, on this website. What is this? This is Leaguepedia's website, so for whatever reason I can't highlight text, but you get the idea. 16 teams drawn into four groups of four, seeded in each region. Uh, each one of those groups had a number one seed, and then there was uh, two number two seeds, and then a number three seed. Riot may want to tweak that seeding process just a little bit because there was some pretty big differences between some of the number three seeds. For whatever reason, the number three seeds, uh, for, for whatever reason, the third place finisher from North America and Europe both got a third place seed. Uh, exactly the same as the wildcard teams when they were clearly vastly stronger than them. So that was a little bit odd. But anyway, they might want to tweak that. But in any case, four groups of four uh, and no two teams from the same region in each group, which was really nice. So the random draw produced these different groups. Hold on, there's a listing of them. So here they go. Here's the listing of the groups. So of course it gives away... Oh, and by the way, I, I should have said this at the beginning, but... Uh, there are massive, uh, massive tournament-destroying spoilers about what happened in this video, so if you haven't seen any of the games and don't want to be spoiled, then don't watch this video. I'm assuming that by now, if you're watching this, you probably are aware of who won most of these matches, but just fair warning. Anyway, so, four groups of four in each group, uh, no two teams from the same region in each group, and you wound up with uh, a number one seed in each group, two number twos, and then a number three seed. Overall, there were some, a few quirks here and there, which is what you'd expect for a random draw. In particular, Group A was not competitive at all uh, and was not really that interesting to watch, but uh, the rest of the groups were quite quite good. Uh, in particular, Group C and D were really, really entertaining and fun to watch. So the format was a big winner. Uh, also on line of the format, Riot also moved to all of the knockout stage matches were best of fives, and that was a very good change because prior to this, only the uh, last year, only the semifinals were best of fives. The quarterfinals were best of three, and that was rather short considering that this was the world championship. And uh, we might have seen some different results if there had been more games. Plus, people just want to see more games in general. In season two, all of the knockout stage games were best of three up until the final. The final was the only best of five, and in season one, there were no best of fives at all. It was all best of three. So. Anyway, big winner on the format, uh, much better. Uh, in Season 2, for those who are Season 3, last year, for those who don't remember, uh, Riot gave the winners of each of the regions, the first place team from each region, a buy into the quarterfinal, which sounds like a good thing, except that by the time that those teams actually got to play, everyone else had already played eight matches before they even got a chance to play, and all those teams hadn't played a competitive match in really months. So they're kind of thrown right in with no warm-up matches, no chance to get a feel for the competition. And the sad thing is we barely got to see a couple of those teams play. Uh, Cloud9 being the classic example, they only got to play three games at the World Championships last year. And everybody kind of wanted to get to see them play more teams. Everyone wanted to see Cloud9 play 
you know, some a, a Korean team, a Chinese team, and we never got to see that. The other team that got screwed over with that was uh, the uh, Gamania Bears, who nobody really remembers, but uh, they only got to play two games because they got matched up against one of the Korean teams, and they got 2 owed and that was it. They didn't get to play any other matches. And the same thing actually happened the previous year as well. There were teams that got uh, buys into the knockout stage, into the quarterfinals. They played you know, two or three games, and they were just out instantly. Uh, in Season 2, Solo Mid was the North American champion, and they got drawn against uh, Zubu Frost in the knockout stage. They played two games, lost both games, and they were immediately out of the tournament. So this is a much better format because every team got to play a guaranteed six matches. We just got to see the teams more uh, because we got to see everybody play in the group stage. It, 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 it's responsible for creating, you know, uh, storylines about how teams look, about how players do, who's playing well, who's not playing well, what are the strengths and weaknesses, what champions do certain teams like to play. Anyway, it was a great, uh, just a much better format, and it made for a very smoothly run tournament. Another good thing, there have been no major technical issues, uh, barely even any pauses. In uh, There were a couple, but there have been very few. And overall, the, the technical and production side has been excellent throughout this tournament. Uh, so real props to, to Riot and all the people have, that have been working on that kind of stuff as well. I've been following the league scene from early on when if you could even watch the matches, it was just it was a win just to be able to see what was going on. I, I remember a lot of tournaments that never started on time. You would They were always at least a half hour late, if not an hour to two hours late. Uh, they'd be running in some grainy... 480p stream, if you were lucky, oftentimes lower than that, where you can barely see what's going on, um, where you would often have uh, the stream, just finding it was difficult because it would be live streamed in different places. You know, it's not like now where everything is always on the same Twitch stream, the official Riot stream. Um, you would have to find it, and it would be in a different place constantly. And finally, you'd have horrible casting half the time as well. You'd have people dressed like I am in like a t-shirt right now, and they'd be doing the cast, and they would miss stuff all the time. You'd have them missing, you'd have people taking Dragon, and no one would even comment on it. Uh, all sorts of just not good stuff. It's really amazing how far the scene has come in really the last three years. Since, 2000, since 2011 when this kind of stuff really started out. I posted a couple months ago some of the retrospective videos on the Season 1 World Championships where they were really just holding this tournament in like a back room at uh, DreamHack in Sweden. And uh, <laughs> there were just like people randomly walking by in the background, like, like what's going on here? We have no idea. So it's amazing how much better it's gotten. Uh, the production values are great. The, they do interviews and replays after every match. And the commentators have been doing an outstanding job. I've, I've been impressed at how much better the commentators have gotten over the years. Uh, the camera work is also top notch. You don't see the people who do the camera work because uh, there are separate people who actually run the spectator client, but they don't miss a lot and they do a really good job queuing up replays if they do miss something. So anyway, it's been a great tournament, no technical problems, uh, competitive matches, very entertaining for the most part. Okay, let's now get into talking about the specific groups and the specific teams and I'll just go through group by group here, covering the teams and then uh, covering, uh, then we'll get to the knockout stage matches after that. So Group A was by far the least interesting of these groups. Coming into this group, the thought was we're going to have a battle for first place between Samsung Galaxy White. They were the number two Korean team, number two seed. And Edward Gaming, which was the number one Chinese seed. So the th thinking is, hey, we've got the best Chinese team. We've got one of the top Korean teams. They're going to go head to head. And even if the rest of the group's not that interesting, it'll be a really good battle for first place between these two. As it turned out, that was not the case because Samsung Galaxy White simply destroyed Edward Gaming uh, in both matches. It was not close. They won and won easily in both matches. The other thought thing that looked like it would be interesting was, hey, the other two teams, AHQ, which is a, a team from Taiwan, and Dark Passage, which is one of the wildcard teams which, from Turkey, the thought was, well, even if the games between, um, you know, what is Samsung White and the bottom two teams and Edward Gaming and the bottom two teams, even if those games aren't competitive, we might have a close battle for third place between AHQ and Dark Passage, you know, thinking there's going to be a battle for first, there'll be a battle for third. Well, um, that didn't turn out to, that was not the case either because Dark Passage was, never close to winning any of their matches. Uh, they really did, did not look especially good. They looked quite a bit behind the other three teams in this group. So what that meant was every game between Dark Passage and anyone else was a stomp, and any game between Samsung White and anyone else was a stomp as well. 
So there were very few matches of any interest in this group, and it's kind of unfortunate that the first weekend was full of these games that were just not interesting and pretty one-sided. The real shocker from this group was AHQ actually managed to take a game off of Edward Gaming. They split one and one, and that meant that they had to play a tiebreaker match. That was probably the most exciting match in this group when AHQ managed to defeat Edward Gaming. Overall, Edward Gaming was very unimpressive in a group that was quite... Uh, they did win the tiebreaker match, and they won the tiebreaker match pretty decisively. So you can see here, one to nothing. Uh, that tiebreaker match was not close. So I don't know if they were overlooking AHQ or if AHQ just got a big lift from the crowd because they were playing in, uh, in Taipei which is, uh, you know, obviously in Taiwan where they're from. But in any case, that was uh, an entertaining match, but Edward Gaming took care of business in the tiebreaker match and moved on from there. But in general, Edward Gaming didn't look very good. Uh, this was the supposed Chinese super team. The uh, I don't follow the Chinese team especially closely, but supposedly they cruised through the, uh, through the LPL and they uh, were pretty dominant in the playoffs, but they didn't look very good at all in the uh, here in the tournament and that continued into the knockout stage they were very underwhelming in this tournament and i think we really expected a lot more from them so edward gaming a bit of a disappointment based on uh, there was quite a bit of hype on this team coming into the tournament a lot of thought that was if a korean team doesn't win they will be the most likely team to win but uh, that that was not the case they did they did not do especially well Okay, Group B. So when we talk about Group B, the by far thing that really overshadowed this group was the suspension of SK Gaming's jungler, Sven Skarin, who was suspended for the first three matches due to making these bizarre racist comments about people from China. I saw what he... he well, I guess he did, technically didn't make comments. He did this weird name change to something that was like... Ching Chong something. Uh, I have no idea what he was thinking. It was incredibly stupid and it served no purpose whatsoever. I know some people on Reddit blamed Riot for this, but honestly, Sven Skarin was responsible. He was just he was just stupid. There was no conceivable reason why you would start making fun of people from China when you're going to play a tournament that's going to be held in Taiwan. So whatever, Sven Skarin got himself banned for the first three games, and uh, that kind of threw this group out of whack because we, thought, we all thought this group would be very close, but... Um, SK Gaming was forced to use a substitute jungler. They had to use the jungler from Unicorn of Unicorns of Love, a team that just qualified for the European LCS. They very clearly looked like a team that had had a player who had not played with them, and their third their three matches where Sven Skarin was uh, was um, suspended were not close. They lost all three of their matches. So the thought was that SK Gaming would have a legit chance to get out of this group, and they might have under normal circumstances, but they lost their first three games. That put them 0-3 in the group, and that meant they had no chance to qualify out of this group. The other thing that made this group not as interesting was we thought that the Taipei Assassins would have a decent chance to get out of this group, or at least be competitive to make it out of this group. They were the champions of, of Southeast Asia, of the uh, Taiwan region. And, you know, this is, of course, the team that won the Season 2 World, to probably the single biggest upset ever in competitive league history. Uh, they have, of course, an entirely different roster other than Bebe, their AD carry. Everybody else is new uh, or is different from the team that won Season 2 Worlds. But there was a, you know, a thought that they would be competitive, that, that they would, you know, have a, ch a, a pretty legitimate chance to get out of this group. Instead, they were very underwhelming. They did not look good at all. Their very first match, they played against Starhorn Rail Club, the Chinese number 2 seed. And they were way ahead in that match. They were ahead by about 8,000 gold. And it looked like, you know, if they could win that match, they might be able to, you know, take a jump into first place immediately, go 1-0 to start the group and really be something. But they completely failed to snowball their lead. They kept getting caught over and over again. They messed up around Baron, and they ended up losing the game in like a 50, 55-minute match. After that, they never really did much the entire rest of the tournament. They beat SK Gaming when uh, Sven Skarin was, uh, was suspended, but they did not win any other matches the entire rest of the, of the group stage. So they finished 1-5, and five, and it was a very unimpressive showing. Uh, I thought they'd do better than that, to be honest. Uh, there was a lot of thought that all four of these teams had a legit chance to make it out of this group. So what were we left with then? Well, unfortunately, the suspension to Sven Skarin and Taipei Assassins just being weaker than most of us thought meant that Group B was not a very competitive group either. It was pretty clear from th from about the second day that Starhorn Royal Club and Team Solo Mid were going to be the two teams to make it out of this group. It was pretty clear those were the teams that were going to make it out. The big question was who would get the first seed and who would get the second seed. Uh, there was a big, big reason to get the number one seed because whoever got number two in this group was going to have to play Samsung White in the knockout stage. Uh, you can see in the bracket down here 
whoever got number second in this group was going to be paired up against Samsung White. So it was a it was a pretty pretty good race for that number one seed. Solo Mid even beat Royal Club on the last day to go. Uh, they split one and one, and it looked like we were headed for a tiebreaker. However, SK Gaming played the spoiler role, and they were actually able to defeat Solo Mid in Solo Mid's final game of the group stage. That meant that Solo Mid was 4-2, and two, Royal Club was 5-1, and one, and Royal Club got the first place ma uh, spot. So SK Gaming actually went 2-1 and one when they had their jungler back. Uh, they beat Taipei Assassins, and they beat uh, Solo Mid in their second game. The SK versus Solo Mid game was very good, very close. Uh, I think it was the sloppiest game that uh, Solo Mid played in that stage. They didn't play especially well. But, uh, and they, they really should have won the game, Solo Mid. Um, they were ahead at the end of the game, but they made a disastrous move uh, into the SK Gaming base. They got aced, and SK cleaned them up and took the match. So, well played to them. And, um, you know, going 2-1 and one in the second swing through the group stage was not, was not the worst result for them. So, um, you know, they have something that they can, you know, put their hang their hat on from that group but anyway yes yeah, so royal club five and one royal club oh i should guess i should say a word about royal club here i'll talk about them more in the knockout stage but royal club is a strange team i have to say this is a very unusual team this is a team that is heavily based on two players insect their jungler who of course is korean and doesn't speak chinese which makes the communication very difficult and also Uzi, their superstar AD carry. Uh, Uzi hard carries them in almost every single game. When he plays well, they win. If he gets shut down, they lose. It's pretty much as simple as that. Their two solo laners, Cola and Korn, uh, have been very unimpressive from what I've seen. They, I mean, they've been okay, but they're certainly not the focus of the team. And in, in all honesty, both of them have lost lane most of the time. But Uzi is just so incredibly good that he's able to carry the team. Uh, as long as Insect can set up the team to make plays, Uzi is usually able to carry them after that. But, I mean, he's been putting up, like, these 15-0 games, 10-1 games, all sorts of crazy stuff, playing Twitch, playing uh, Lucian, playing some Tristana in there, you know, just, just doing some hardcore carrying. If he doesn't play well, they lose. It's pretty much as simple as that. Anyway, so the first weekend, not that interesting because Group A was... Very few matches that were competitive. Group B, the whole the whole thing was just who will get first place, and there were a number of matches that didn't end up meaning anything in that group. The second weekend, Group C and Group D, much more competitive, much closer. Uh, both of these groups were really, really entertaining because all of the team, especially in Group C, because in Group C, all of the teams were able to beat one another, and uh, this was definitely the group of death for this particular tournament. Anyway, so in Group C, we had the Korean number one seed, Samsung Galaxy Blue. We had the Chinese number, uh, what is it, the Chinese number three seed, OMG. North American number three seed, LMQ, and then European uh, number two seed, Fnatic. Let's go through each of these one at a time. Samsung Blue, the question was, would they just easily make their way through the group or would they drop some games? They ended up did losing a game to Fnatic, one of the big upsets of the tournament, one of the big surprising results. Uh, they actually lost that uh, on the first day, and uh, at that point, it was the first time any Korean team had lost a match to, in the tournament to date, so there was a lot of hand-wringing of, oh my god, Samsung, Galaxy has, Samsung Blue has actually lost a match. Match. They're not invincible. They can lose that sort of thing. And after that, though, they played much better. They actually looked shaky in their other match too. Uh, when they played, which one of these teams? Um, I think when they played uh, OMG, they looked a little bit shaky in their first game. But they played much better after the first day. Uh, they were one and one the first day. They went four and zero after that. They looked much much better uh, after that. So. Yeah, they were a little bit shaky early on, but pulled it together after the first day. OMG, the third Chinese team, they were not expected to do that much, but uh, and they actually had a really rough first day as well. They went 0-2 the first day. They lost to uh, they lost to Samsung Blue the first day, and then, well, actually I can just pull up the list of games right here. Um, where is that? Group C matches. Here we go. I might as well just pull up the list of matches here. Yeah, uh, they, they lost to LMQ in the first match, and then they lost to Samsung Blue in their second match. And they were sitting 0-2 in the group, and it looked like they were probably not going to make it out. Conversely, LMQ went 2-0 the first day. LMQ beat OMG, and LMQ beat Fnatic. And they were 2-0 in the group, and uh, it looked like they were going to be in really good shape. They were, in fact, they were actually guaranteed a tiebreaker game as long as they didn't go 0-4 
in all of the rest of their matches for the rest of the uh, for the rest of the group stage. So they were in really good shape after the first day, and a lot of people weren't really expecting that much from LMQ. In particular, on that first day, Xiao Wei Xiao was just completely dominant in mid. Uh, he was getting solo kills 1v1. Uh, I can't remember what champions he played in those games, but he had an amazing first day, uh, which was good for them because LMQ's Ackerman, who had really carried them in North America early in the summer split this year, Ackerman did not play especially well here at Worlds. Just didn't have a very good tournament. Unfortunately for LMQ, after the first day, Xiao Wei Xiao, uh, you know, lost his Super Saiyan powers and was just went didn't play poorly but went back to sort of average play and after that they were not able to snowball their games and unfortunately for them they ended up losing all of the rest of their matches so uh, as the tournament went as the group stage went on OM OMG got stronger LMQ got weaker and OMG played better and better as the tournament went on as for the last member of this group Fnatic Fnatic had a wild up and down ride through the group stage uh, Fnatic immediately they initially lost to LMQ but then they beat Samsung Blue, uh, putting them in a, this bizarre state in the group where they had beaten what was perceived as the best team, but then lost as to what was perceived as the worst team. And that then set up what was the most interesting game, not just of the group stage, but in my opinion, the, the best game of the entire tournament, which was the match right here, Fnatic versus OMG. The first time that these two teams, or maybe it was this one, I can't remember if it was the first game or the second game they played. An absolutely wild match between the two teams that lasted for like 70 minutes, uh, involved multiple base races at different points in time. It was the single closest game of league I've ever seen, uh, like the closest I've ever seen a team come to winning and not end up winning the match. Fnatic got down to one hit away from killing the Nexus on OMG, uh, literally one auto attack away from killing the Nexus, but they could not get that last auto attack. Um, and people have gone back and analyzed how if they had done certain things differently, if they had, you know, used the, the rumble, if Soaz had used his rumble ult differently, if, uh, you know, some, if such and such had, you know, maybe if someone had sold other items to purchase AD items, they would have been able to get it done. But they came up one auto attack short, the game lasted another 15 minutes, and ultimately uh, OMG ended up winning that match. Just a crazy, super exciting match. Go and watch this, go back and watch this match if you haven't seen it before. The casters were going insane. They were literally jumping up and down on the caster task. Uh, they were so excited about this match. And it turned out to be a hugely important game because based on that game, Fnatic ended up losing the, uh, Fnatic ended up 2-4, and four, OMG ended up 3-3, three and three, OMG ended up going through in second place. If you swap the result of that one game, Fnatic ends up in second place. So, ooh, for poor Fnatic, you know that you know that the, that the players will think back on that and think, we were one auto attack away from killing their Nexus. We would have gone through, we would have made it to the knockout stage, and they actually would have had a pretty good route to advance in the knockout stage. Uh, I mean, yet they would have had to play Najin White Shield, but as we saw, Najin White Shield was not invincible in the knockout stage. So Fnatic really could have done, I mean, Fnatic, I know they ended up 2-4 and four in the group. They ended up winning the rematch with LMQ, so they ended up splitting 1-1. One and one. Um, Overall, I didn't think Fnatic played that badly. I mean, they, they had a win over Blue. They really should have had a win over L OMG. Um, it wasn't their best tournament in terms of results, but they didn't play that badly. The biggest issue was probably Soaz's champion pool was really exploited by the other teams. Uh, well, I mean, he played a lot of stuff, but he didn't play it that well, I guess. So a lot of people, it seemed like they were picking on the top lane matchup there. Uh, Reckless played well, I thought. Pekka was good in some games, not so good in other games. Um, but the other teams really seem to be focusing on their top lane. Anyway, Fnatic will be back. They always bounce back. It was not, I really didn't think they did that badly, but they were just unable to make it out of the group. So Samsung Blue came out in first. OMG came out in second place in a very close, very entertaining mat, uh, group stage. Then finally, Group D, another wildly entertaining group. This group was perceived as having three teams that all would be very strong contenders to make it out of the group. Najin White Shield, who is the Korean number three seed, but all the Korean teams are incredibly good. Cloud9, the American, North American number two seed. And Alliance, the European number one seed and the European super team. And then finally, the, the general thought was the uh, you had the wildcard team, Kaboom Esports, the uh, Brazilian team. The thought was Kaboom will lose all of their matches and these three teams will be in a death match to see who gets that second place position. 
between them. So that was the belief going into this. Uh, as far as how the group played out, let's go ahead and do the show, uh, show different stuff here. Right on the first day, Cloud9 had a really good first day. They of course, they beat Kaboom, no big surprise there. But uh, in the head-to-head -head match against Alliance, they won that match, which was obviously a big win for North America. Alliance did not have a good first day. Uh, they played Cloud9 and lost the head-to-head. -head. Then they played against Nodge and White Shield and lost that matchup as well. So they started out actually 0-2 in this group, meaning that they were in... Now, granted, they hadn't played Kaboom yet, but they were in a lot of trouble right there. Nodge and White Shield, um, you know, also swept the initial group 3-0, and it looked like they were in... You know, it looked like they were pretty clear set to go through 3-0 at that point. However, the second time through the group is where things started to get crazy on the backswing through where everybody played each other again for the second time. Alliance won the rematch with Cloud9, so they were split 1-1 one and one in the group, and it looked like there was a good chance that they'd be headed to a tiebreaker match. After that, then the big, first uh, big upset. Alliance won against Najin Shield, and they didn't just win against Najin Shield. They destroyed Najin Shield. They played a perfect game. They had no deaths, no towers lost. They... Gave up no dragons, they gave up no barons. They took every tower, every dragon, every baron, nobody died. And that was just an, a, a complete statement victory for Alliance. Uh, I mean, they they just stomped Nodge and White Shield. Nodge and White Shield looked completely helpless. And remember, up to that point in time, Shield hadn't lost a single game. So everyone's like, oh my god, Alliance, they've got to win over White Shield. Um, you know, they're, they're basically guaranteed of going through in this group. They'll be either first or second. Uh, you know, all they have to do is beat Kaboom in the last match, because that was the only team they still had yet to play. Everyone's like, all they have to do is beat Kaboom in their last match. They're guaranteed at least a tiebreaker, and they're probably facing Shield for, uh, in a tiebreaker match to determine who wins the group. However, on that last day, things got pretty crazy. First of all, Cloud9 beat Kaboom, which again was no surprise. Kaboom was 0-5. No one was expecting much. Then Cloud9 was still in a position where they were going to have to beat White Shield just to force a uh, just to force a three-way tiebreaker. Um, the thought was it, not Shield, Cloud9, and Alliance would all be four and two, but Cloud9 thinking we have to beat White Shield in our last match or we're eliminated from the tournament and we're going out right here. But then, the biggest upset of the tournament. Uh, in a match nobody saw coming, Kaboom played Alliance and ended up winning. And actually won pretty convincingly. They, uh, the Brazilian team, they were 0-5, but they played really well. Uh, they got an early, I believe they got an early first blood. Um, their jungler, Danagorn, got some really nice ganks off in the top lane. They mostly snowballed this off of top lane where, uh, unfortunately, Wicked looked really uncomfortable for Alliance. Uh, one of the things that we saw in this tournament was Wicked looked godly while he was on Irelia, and he looked pretty shaky on everyone else. Froggen was also playing Fizz in, the, in that game, and it, it, Fizz is one of those picks where if your team falls behind, you quickly become very useless. Fizz being an assassin, he's either, Fizz is a champion where if you get ahead, you're just rolling, you know, you're just face rolling people. But if you're behind, you're in a lot of trouble. And um, Kaboom, just, they got ahead, they didn't make mistakes, they cleanly snowballed the game, and they won in about 30, 35 minutes. Uh, it was really the shocker of the tournament. Nobody expected them to win any matches. There were a lot of people on Reddit saying, why are the wildcard teams even here? There's no point, just don't bring them to the tournament. These games are pointless to watch. Well, they looked very silly afterwards, so Kaboom really played the underdog role and just completely threw this group into utter chaos because all of a sudden, instead of Alliance being in a position where, hey, they're going to play White Shield in a tiebreaker to go through, uh, then they were in a position where they needed Cloud9 to lose just, for, just to force a tiebreaker match, but then immediately thereafter in the next game, Cloud9 did in fact beat Nodge and White Shield. It was a close game. Cloud9 was actually behind in this game, but they pulled off this amazing team fight around the 50-minute mark, and uh, the death timers were so long that they were able to push for the win after that. They actually won a team fight. Uh, they actually aced Nodge and Shield in a team fight where they were about four or 5,000 gold behind. And yes, that doesn't mean as much when you're at like the 50 minute mark, but still won a clean fight, got an ace, and were able to push for the win because the death timers were so long. So again, another shocking upset. Result being, Shield and Cloud9 were both 4-2. and two. They were both uh, tied. Alliance eliminated, did not even get to go to a tiebreaker. Very sad for them. Uh, and I didn't even think they played that badly. I mean, they, they beat Cloud9. They took a game off of Shield uh, and looked dominant in taking a game off of Shield. But they uh, either overlooked Kaboom or just played a bad game at the wrong time. And so they got knocked out, didn't manage to make it through. 
then, uh, well, Leakpedia isn't showing it here, but there was a tiebreaker match here in Group D as well. Shield and Cloud9 had to play a tiebreaker match. Unfortunately for Cloud9, they lost the coin flip, which normally would, you'd think, well, why does the coin flip matter? But uh, they lost the coin flip, which meant that they had to be on red side. And one of the things we learned was Cloud9 is a much better blue side team than a red side team. That might seem kind of weird, but they were much stronger on blue side because of High's champion pool. High being their mid laner and shot caller. High really could not play very many champions. It was it was the biggest weakness of Cloud9 as a team. He could really only play about really maybe three or so champions. Uh, he he was playing uh, he was playing Zed. He was playing what else? I think he was playing a little. Or he was playing Zed, Syndra, and that was about it. Unfortunately, when he was not on Zed or Syndra, he was not really able to play very much. So they lost the coin flip. They had to be on red side. That meant that they could not like leave a Zed pick open or a Syndra pick open. And uh, High got banned out. He got forced onto a Talon pick, and High's Talon was not very good. Unfortunately, he tried to play Talon as a counter pick to Zed, but it just didn't work out. So they ended up losing the tiebreaker match. That meant that they were put in the second seed. That came out in second seed, and that was a bad thing because that meant they would have to play Samsung Blue in the knockout stage. What they wanted, uh, everybody wanted to be the number one seed because that meant they played OMG. And OMG had looked, I mean, they got, they looked better and better as the group stage went on, but they did lose three games. And I'm sure you'd rather fa face a three and three OMG team than a five and one number one Korean seed Samsung Blue. So anyway, that was how the bracket stage shook out. So we ended up with Samsung White against Team Solo Mid, Samsung Blue against Cloud9, Edward Gaming against Starhorn Royal Club in a Chinese head-to-head -head matchup. And OMG against Najin White Shield. Uh, the bottom side of the bracket was clearly perceived as being the much weaker side of the bracket. The two Samsung teams being on the top side were generally seen as anyone who's on this side of the bracket will lose to the Ch Korean teams. And we're going to have a Korean semifinal, which is in fact what happened. So everyone wanted to be on this side of the bracket. As it turned out, all the Chinese teams had a party on this side. And ended up taking three of the four spots. So let's then talk about the knockout stage. You can see the spoiler results right here. Let me go ahead and cover these matchups in particular. First up, Samsung White against Team Solo Mid. Samsung White was stated by Solo Mid's uh, coaching staff that uh, they perceived Samsung White to be much better than everyone else in the tournament. Uh, Solo Mid's coach, Loco Doco, said that they had scrimmed all these other teams and he thought that they could beat any team except Samsung White. Uh, that was the perception going into this. They, like, they said, look, we'll do our best, but Samsung White's better than everyone else, and they're actually a lot better than everyone else. So Solo Mid was not super confident going into this match. And indeed, if you look at the group stages, Samsung White did go 6-0 and in groups, and all of the other teams lost at least one match. They were the only team undefeated in groups. So... Game number one, Samsung White comes out and just smashes Solo Mid. It's not close whatsoever. Uh, anyone who was expecting an upset, that you weren't going to see it in that match. Game number two, Samsung White comes out and they begin doing some quasi-troll picks. They picked Singed in the top lane. They blind picked, uh, I think they blind picked Cassidy in mid or something like that. Uh, unfortunately for Solo Mid, it was still a stomp. Uh, White got ahead early, and it was just a complete snowball. I think they were like 10,000 gold ahead at 25 minutes or something like that. Complete and utter stomp. Game number three, Samsung White does more troll picks. Again, they're blind picking Fizz, they're blind picking Cassidy. Uh, that's pretty disrespectful, in all honesty, uh, if you're familiar with how these things work. People pick champions like Fizz and Cassidy generally as counter picks because they're so easily shut down in lane. By taking these picks just blindly, immediately, and allowing anyone to, allowing the other team to pick the matchup, what Samsung White was doing is they were saying, we don't respect your team, we think we can play anything and still beat you. So, like I said, quasi-troll, quasi-disrespectful uh, picks there. Not totally off meta, I mean, they're not picking, like, Urgot mid or something ridiculous like that, but, but definitely disrespectful picks. Quasi-troll picks, as I said. Anyway, to everyone's surprise, Solo Mid was able to get kills in a level 1 fight, and uh, they actually got an early lead, and then smoothly snowballed the game, played well, and actually did manage to take a game off Samsung White. So they were able to punish the disrespectful picks in Game 3. But after that, in Game 4, Samsung White picked normal meta picks again, and smoothly and easily snowballed the game to a win. Uh, when they were playing seriously, they looked significantly better 
than Team Solo Mid. Now, that said, Solo Mid, um, for a team that was struggling much of the summer split in North America, they ended up winning North American regionals in the playoffs. They made it out of the group stage. They took a, you know, they took a match off Royal Club. They took a game off Samsung White, which no one else has been able to do, to do thus far. I think that they'll be pretty happy with their performance thus far. I think it was a good season for them overall. Making it to Worlds is always tough. They made it out of the group stage. They even took a game off Samsung White. So, yes, maybe Samsung White was pseudo trolling, but you still you still got to beat them, and they did. So I think that they have a lot to you know a lot to a lot to be proud of in this tournament. All right, next match, Samsung Blue against Cloud9. This one was also widely perceived to be heavily in Blue's favor, and with good reason, being one of the top Korean teams. Interestingly enough, though, when this series started, Cloud9 uh, was able to take a match in the very first game. They actually started out 1-0 in a big surprise. Uh, it looked like Samsung Blue was just caught off guard. I don't remember the exact specifics of the match. I'd have to remember. i have to go back and look at it again. Um, they just list the results here. They don't list the um, actual stats from each game here on this page. But uh, yeah, Sam, um, Cloud9 actually won the first match after the uh, actually took the first game and went up 1-0. And people were like, "Oh my God, is this is this actually going to happen? Are we going to have an upset here? Can uh, can a North American team actually beat a Korean team?" After all, Cloud9 had taken a game off Najin White Shield earlier, so proving that the North American teams had, in fact, gotten to the point where they can maybe not consistently win against the Korean teams, but at least take matches from here and there. That's much better than in Season 3 when it was, you know, almost embarrassing how badly the Korean teams beat the North American teams. But after that, Samsung Blue looked much better in Game Number 2, looked much better in Game Number 3. Uh, they were doing pick... They were they improved their picks and bans, mostly. They were getting um, good picks and good, good picks and doing a good job of forcing high on the champions he was not comfortable with and taking advantage of some of the matchups there. Game number four uh, turned into another base race, a very interesting ending. Cloud9 was way behind for pretty much the entire match. Blue got ahead early, and um, they were really, I think they were ahead by about, yeah, they were ahead by about 10,000 gold by the mid-game. But Cloud9, to their credit, was able to make some things happen. They, uh, had, they had balls playing Rumble that game, was able to pull off uh, a really good, uh, really good catch where they were able to use the Rumble ult. On, uh, or maybe I'm thinking of a different game. But anyway, they were able to get the, a couple really good catches. They were able to get kills on um, Dade and Deft, the two carries on um, Samsung Blue. And they, they ended up deciding, like, look, we're so far behind, we were able to get kills on three members of the team. Let's just go for it. We've got to try to base race. We're, never, we're 10,000 gold behind. We're never going to win playing standard. So they did this push-up mid, and they actually managed to get the inner turret, the inhibitor turret, the inhibitor, both of the nexus turrets, and they got about 70% of the nexus killed. But unfortunately for them, Samsung Blue was able to revive, was able to kill them in time. And Samsung Blue aced them and then just pushed down mid and ended the game. But they managed to make it pretty close. If you were watching the player cams, all the blue players were, you know, pretty terrified that they were going to lose this game. But they were way ahead. In. I mean, let's be clear. They were far, far ahead in gold in this game. But Cloud9 almost pulled it off. Uh, Cloud9's movements around the maps, their rotations, to use the buzzword, were very good all throughout this tournament. The biggest issue for them was High's limited champion pool. But uh, they, I mean, they, they really looked like they had a great understanding of the game. It's just, it was the mechanical side that kind of was the failure for them. Just mechanically being outplayed by people who are better. Which is something we, you know, typically it's the other way around. The knock on North America has always been, well, they have the mechanics, but they don't understand the game. They don't move around the map well enough. They don't do an enough good enough job of prioritizing objectives. So that was positive to see. And... Um, Overall, you can't say, I mean, a good tournament for them. They made it out of a tough, made it to Worlds, made it out of a tough group. Almost got to a deciding f fifth game against Samsung Blue. Uh, Hart was playing Nami in that game number four and actually landed, uh, a lot of people have said, oh, I want to go back to this page, a lot of people have said, you know, Hart, he landed a three-man bubble in the, in the whole base race that delayed Cloud9 just enough just enough for everybody to revive on Blue and stop that push from happening. So uh, it was quite close in that game. All right, so anyway, that meant that the Samsung teams would move on. In the other side of the bracket, like I said, mostly Chinese teams, Starhorn Royal Club against Edward Gaming. Royal Club, the number two seed out of China. Edward Gaming, the number one seed out of China. This series was very entertaining. It was very fun to watch. As expected from the Chinese teams, a lot of aggression, a lot of kills. Uh, quite a few games where they had, like, 
the final kill count was like 25 to 20, the kind of things you typically don't see in professional games, but uh, a lot of back and forth here. Honestly, it was an entertaining series. It was kind of a sloppily played series, to be perfectly honest. I didn't think the quality of gameplay was that high, but it was very entertaining. And Royal Club ended up coming out on top. Overall, Edward Gaming really did not impress in this series. Um, just didn't think that they lived up to the hype, basically. Name, in particular, Name was the super hyped player. I mean, he was good, but uh, Uze was better, to be perfectly honest. Uze was better in the in the um, AD versus AD head-to-head -head matchup. And so Edward Gaming finished this tournament with a record of 6-6. Six and six. Well, no, wait a minute. What was it? Uh, they had... Yeah, they finished up 6-6 six and six in this tournament. 6 wins and 6 losses. And considering that four of their wins were over AHQ and Dark Passage, that's not very impressive. It was not a good showing from them. So kind of expected more out of the top Chinese team, uh, at least based on their reputation. Again, I do not watch the LPL. I don't know that much about the teams. All I can really go by is what I saw at Worlds. They didn't impress that much for what was supposed to be the Chinese super team. Then finally over here, this was, pr this was by far the biggest surprise in the knockout stage. OMG against Najin White Shield. It was widely expected that Najin Shield would win this match. Uh, most people thought we would have a Korea vs. Korea finals. That Shield would just easily advance out of all these Chinese teams. That did not happen. OMG showed up big and they dominated this series. Um, in particular, Go Going was playing Rise in these games. For whatever reason, uh, they, the, Najin Shield let him get Rise multiple times and he was just hard, hard carrying in these matches out of the top lane playing Rise. But um, they really broke the spirit of Najin Shield. After the second game, all the players on Shield had their heads down. They like you, they were like stunned. They didn't know what was going on. And in the third game, they just mentally looked like they were not in it. They were looked like they were not ready to play that match. They were just devastated when they lost at the end. Um, and the Chinese players were trying to cheer them up afterwards, but. Uh, Anytime Korea plays China, there's this rivalry between the two. Um, the country, both the Chinese and Korean fans take this pretty seriously. And so for a Korean team to lose to a Chinese team, that was pretty, pretty big deal in the Korean scene. And, and especially to get stomped 3-0. And the games, honestly, were not really that close. They were all pretty one-sided in favor of OMG. It was, frankly, kind of embarrassing for Najin White Shield. So... Really shocking result. Um, just very, very surprising. Uh, Shield really thought they'd make it to the finals and probably play one of the Samsung teams there, but that did not happen. And uh, their their exit from the tournament was was pretty surprising. Uh, anyway, Najin White Shield finished the tournament with a record of four wins and five losses. So Korea not un uh, the Korean team's very good, but not unbeatable. Definitely not Najin White Shield on such a high going into this tournament, but uh, didn't didn't end up working for them. Finally, semifinals here. Another shocker in the semifinal between Samsung White and Samsung Blue. The general perception was that was that Samsung White was better, but most it, it, you know we thought this would be a close series. We thought that it would probably be three one or three two in favor of Samsung White. It was not a close series, and Samsung White just destroyed Samsung Blue. I mean, really humiliated them in this series. 3-0, the matches were not close. Samsung White played seriously in each match, and wow, do they look good when everybody is playing, <laughs> when everybody's playing seriously. When, um, you know, Imp is playing on Twitch, when Dandy is making plays happen in the jungle. Uh, Looper and Pawn are both winning, they're winning, you know, winning top, winning mid, they look unstoppable when they're on their game, and they were on their game in this matchup. Poor Samsung Blue just, uh, you know, they were in tears after this game because they had been beaten and it was not close. Also, they're making changes to the Korean scene next year, uh, OGN, the Korean League of Legends system. They're making changes next year whereby each, uh, each organization is only going to be able to carry one team. So no more Samsung White and Samsung Blue. Uh, currently, each organization can field two teams in OGN. Uh, I like this move. I think it's a good thing. It, there's just too much conflict of interest with each organization running multiple teams. You saw that this year when the uh, SKT, SK Telecom, uh, was had their two teams in the same group, and it was questionable as to whether they were throwing matches to try and get both of their teams out of the uh, out of the group stage and into the knockout stage. Uh, apparently, people say that wasn't the case, but it sure looked like they were match-fixing at times. There's a reason why other professional sports leagues do not allow one owner or one ownership group to have multiple teams in the same league. So I'm glad that OGN is moving away from that. There's, uh, there's just too much conflict of interest. Um, you know, 
Samsung should be able to field one team, you know, field your best team, Samsung, but you shouldn't be able to have two teams. And in particular, this was causing problems because the top organizations like Samsung and um, SK Telecom and you know, what's the other one? There's another really big company uh, that is escaping my name, but the top or the big money organizations were really monopolizing all the top talent in Korea because, you know, they're, they're carrying not just five players, they're carrying 10 players across two teams, and then they're often carrying more players as substitutes. So it was really starving the Korean scene of, of talent because the top you know, the big money groups were just monopolizing all of the best talent. So anyway, there's going to be changes next year, but that means that Samsung Blue might be disbanded at the end of this season. So a lot of these players, you know, they that team might be breaking up because Samsung White, if they can only carry one team, Samsung's probably going to carry the White roster. So oh, changes are coming, and for the, for the Blue players, this was pretty, you know, pretty disappointing for them. This was their chance to win a world championship, and, you know, they lost to their sister team, so... Pretty sad for them, but somebody's got to lose. I mean, that's the thing about Worlds. It can be harsh. Somebody's got to win, and somebody's got to lose. And Blue eliminated their dreams of winning Worlds, not going to come to pass. Then finally, the last semifinal between Royal Club and OMG, a rematch from last year. Last year, these teams also played in the knockout stage, and Starhorn Royal Club defeated OMG. These teams are major rivals in the Chinese scene, as I understand it. So OMG... Their players really wanted to get back at Royal Club. They wanted to get revenge for losing in the semifinal. In the was it the semifinal last year? It was the semifinal or the quarterfinal. I can't remember which one. But they did play in the knockout stage last year. OMG was hoping that they would get revenge for losing last year. Unfortunately for them, that was not the case. They ended up losing three two. The sad thing is. I think OMG's better than Starhorn Row Club. After even though they lost the series, I still think OMG's better. Um, they defeated White Shield convincingly, whereas Starhorn Row Club just kind of squeaked past the unimpressive Edward Gaming. In these matches, I watched all five of these matches just a couple days ago. I thought uh, OMG was better in four of the five matches. They had leads in four out of five games, uh, and and big leads, not small leads. So game number one, OMG won pretty convincingly. Game number two way ahead. They were five or 6,000 gold ahead. They screwed it up around Baron. Starhorn Road Club took a Baron and was able to get back and win the game from there. But it, it, OMG should have won that game. Should have won game number two. Game number three. OMG runs this weird uh, split push and poke comp. Well, not weird. It was a split push and poke comp. And they got incredibly far ahead. They were 15,000 gold ahead at one point, but they could not close the game out. Uh, they struggled to close it out. Royal Club was able to do what you have to do against uh, Split Push and Poke. Force a hard engage. They uh, got, a, got a hard engage fight in mid uh, using Fiddlesticks Jungle of all things. Yes, they're running Fiddlesticks Jungle. Got a hard engage, were able to pick up some kills, pushed for an inhibitor, and they actually went and they were able to get a second hard engage fight and win the game about a few minutes later. They were actually still down 8,000 gold when they won the game, so it's pretty incredible. OMG should have won that game easily, but they just could not close it out. Game number four, OMG got way ahead, snowballed the game and won. So, four games played, all four games, OMG should have won. Uh, legitimately, they should have won all four of those games. Then finally, in the fifth and deciding game, Royal Cup played their best match, they got way ahead, and they won that game pretty easily to win it 3-2. and two. But I still think OMG's better. I know they lost the series, but they should have won that series easily. But anyway... Starhome Royal Club deserves credit. They beat OMG last year. They beat them again here. In the end, should have, could have, would have, doesn't matter. Royal Club won the match, and they're moving on. So, we have our big final then between Samsung White and Starhorn Royal Club that's coming up in a couple days as I record this match. So, what's this final going to look like? Well, uh... I think it's going to be a stomp. I don't think it's going to be close at all. Royal Club was in the final last year. They got destroyed by S SKT Telecom. They're in the final again this year. And by the way, major props to them for making it not just back to Worlds, but making it to the final again two years in a row. That's really incredible. Uh, anyway, so major props to them, but I think they're going to get 3 0 by Samsung White. White will play seriously because it is the World Championship and the lots on the line. When they're playing seriously, they it's going to be very hard for anyone to beat them. Uh, Royal Club... I think they kind of got lucky in the draw to make it this far, and I think that they matched up well with the teams they played. Uh, like I said, they had this kind of weird back-and-forth sloppy series with Edward Gaming. Royal Club matches up very well with OMG because their strengths match up with OMG's weaknesses. Uh, OMG's weakness is their bottom lane. Sun is 
clearly the weakness of this team. Go going and cool are the strength of OMG as a team. San is their AD carry. He is by far the weakest player on the team. But that is the strength of Royal Club. Uzi is their best player. So they were able to exploit that in that matchup. Unfortunately for Royal Club, their, uh, you know, their AD carries Uzi. Well, unfortunately, in the final, they have to play Imp, who is probably just as good. I mean, it's going to be a fascinating matchup to watch these two go at each other. Hopefully, we'll see 2v2 and not lane swaps here. But unfortunately, um, White also has an incredibly good AD carry. And unlike Royal Club, which has weak solo laners, Korn and Cola, as I said, have been unimpressive, they're going to have to play against Pawn and Looper, who have been extremely strong solo laners, especially Pawn, who has just been dominant in mid in these matches. So I don't see this ending well. I think this will be 3-0. I think this is going to be a stomp. I don't think it'll be close. I think the games will be 30 minute, over in 30 minutes. Uh, if Royal Club takes a game, I will be impressed. But I think White will be out for blood. I think they're going to play seriously. And I think this is going to be over quickly. Royal Club reminds me a little bit of CLG in North America. Uh, and, and I make that comparison because they're a team that's heavily based on their AD in the bottom lane and also reliant on their jungler making things happen. They're also a team that's wildly inconsistent from game to game. Royal Club will look amazing one game when Uzi gets ahead and all of a sudden he's just killing everyone. And then they can look terrible in other games. So they have this, they just swing back and forth crazily in terms of strength from game to game. And that's also very reminiscent of Counter Logic. They'll look great one minute, they look terrible the next. So Royal Club has the potential <laughs> has the potential to be to do well against Samsung White but I just don't think that's going to happen I think this is 3-0 I don't think this is close Samsung White looks like pretty clearly the best team in the world right now and I think they're going that's going to I think we're going to see that in the uh, in the final in a couple days so maybe I'll be wrong I'm hoping it's an entertaining series but I just don't think that's going to happen also keep in mind the respective records of these teams Samsung White is 12 wins and one loss that's yeah the 12 wins and one loss the other team, Sorhon Royal Club, well, so far, they have 11 wins, and they have, what is it, uh, what are they, 11 and 5 overall? Uh, yeah, they're 11 and 5 right now. That's a pretty big difference, 12 and 1 against 11 and 5, uh, against a team that's only dropped a single match the entire tournament, against a team that's lost 5 times. That's a pretty big difference. So, anyway, that's my thoughts overall. Well, this video has rambled on for long enough. It should be roughly 40, 45 minutes right about now. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed hearing some of my thoughts. Maybe I'll look like an idiot when uh, Starhorn Royal Club pulls off a gigantic upset this weekend. I guess we'll see. Uh, it would be entertaining. I'll be rooting for that to happen. Uh, I actually don't like Samsung White that much. They strike me as kind of jerks, to be perfectly honest. Why someone is trolling in the, you know, in the knockout stage of the World Finals is beyond me. But uh, anyway, I do think White will take it, and I think he'll take it pretty easily. It's been a great tournament, a lot of great matches. Uh, the two best matches that I'd suggest would go back and watch the Fnatic against OMG crazy base race. Go back and watch the amazing Kaboom upset uh, where the crowd really got into it and it turned into this you know, amazing um, underdog upset. And go back and watch the, o uh, the OMG versus uh, Royal Club game number three because you have got, got this incredible contrast between a poke and split push comp and a hard engage comp, and that's always so much fun to watch because the, the play styles were completely different. And in the end, hard engage ended up winning despite being behind the whole game. It was a, it was a fantastic match to watch. So anyway, thanks for watching. Uh, hope to, as I said, hope to put some more content up on this YouTube channel soon. If you want to catch me day to day, check out the Twitch live stream. It's linked under all of these videos. It's in the description for all of them. Until next time, have a good one. See you guys again soon. Take care.